We come now to a very important discussion. It is session 14 about forgiveness. Rest, forgiving as God has forgiven you. We find this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That is a tall order for Christians, to forgive as God has forgiven them. Yet it is the very words of the Apostle Paul under the authority of the Holy Spirit that we are to forgive according to the example of God Almighty, according to the one who is perfect, who has never sinned, we are to forgive like him. And of course, we have sinned. Every one of us, last one of us has sinned. Here's a very important statement about forgiveness as we take rest from our inner world to the world. Forgiveness is a premeditated condition of the heart based on the fact that God in Christ has already forgiven you. Every last one of us is going to be sinned against by someone else. Because just like ourselves, the other people, the people in our families, our parents, our children, our spouses, husband or wife, our fellow workers, staff members in a church, people who work in a company, business together. Out on the streets, the other, the other drivers, they too are sinners, and they might sin against you by cutting in front of you or beeping their horns behind you, agitating you. Someone may trip you accidentally or intentionally. Each of us right now is thinking of someone that has done, done some injury to us, perhaps the betrayal, being a friend for a time and then taking advantage of us or speaking against us, gossiping against us. The list goes on. We are to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. That's a tall order. The success of our forgiveness and offering forgiveness is largely dependent on us thinking ahead of time of how we have been forgiven by God. It's a premeditated condition, absorbing the truth that God has forgiven us as sinners. And therefore, we are to turn around and offer the same to those sinners who sin against us. And this is a time of private premeditation that we need to go through, each last one of us, and ponder not so much on how we've been offended against how others have hurt us, but to ponder the fact that we have hurt God. We have crucified Christ, the means of our forgiveness. And to let that soak into our beings for those who have realized, come to grip with the fact that they have been forgiven are most often those who will release others forgiving them. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. How does God forgive? Let's break this down and look at it closely. Forgiving as God forgives means you, the offended, take the initiative. Right now, I am emailing a person who, that is convinced they've been attacked by another. And uh, they think the offender ought to come to them and apologize. Now, sometimes the offender doesn't even know what he or she has done to a friend or to the other person. They don't even know what they have done. Perhaps it was incidental and accidental. Perhaps their motives have been judged as impure when they really are pure. And they may have forgotten the incident, not knowing that they have hurt someone. So if you don't go to them, how are they going to know? How can they come and confess to you if they don't realize it? But even if they do know, we are to take the initiative, make the first steps. We are to forgive in our hearts in a premeditated fashion. 
you, the offended, take the initiative, because that's what God did. Let's look at biblical history. Let's go way back to the first sin. God came to Adam and Eve, but the Lord God called to man. This is after they have sinned, eaten of the fruit that they were forbidden to eat from. Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he here is Adam. Who told you, God says, that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So there we have this conversation between God, the perfect, and Adam, now who is a sinner, very imperfect. It is the Lord that calls out to the man, where are you, Adam? Hello? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Um, Adam, who told you you were naked? You see, without sin, there was, there was no awareness of that, of their nakedness. There was no shame, which often comes because of sin. Who told you that you were naked, Adam? And God goes right to the point, to the heart of the matter. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? There's the question. And of course he had. But God took the initiative. We look further down in the chapter, just a few verses away from this text, and we read, and I will put, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel." Now this is a conversation not about Adam now, but it's a conversation with Satan that God is having. And a seed would come, as we fill in the rest of the verses, a seed who would be a descendant to come later on, and it's really a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And there'd be, he would come, an offspring, and he will crush your head, Satan, though you will strike his heel. You'll give him some pain while he's on earth, all right, but he will crush your head. In other words, God was already taking the initiative to save mankind. Right away in the book of Genesis, it is foretold that God went to his plan of salvation. Immediately mentioned, God took the initiative to find Adam and Eve in the garden. He didn't wait for them well, when you're sick and tired of your sin and you sit in there and stew a while and when you feel miserable enough, maybe you'll come to me and we'll talk about this. That was not his posture. God rather stepped forth, took the initiative to come to man. And he could have said, well, man, you've got yourself into this fix. You get yourself out. You figure a way out to get rid of your sin. Work off, try working it off for a while. But uh, I'm just going to wait until you come to me with a plan. No, God gave hints immediately of a plan to save man. Remember the words, forgive as you have been forgiven by God through Christ. You take the initiative if you are going to forgive others. Do it in the pattern of God. He, the one who sinned against, goes to the sinner who has sinned against him. Very important. He took the initiative. This man who's emailing me is expecting this other person because supposedly they're more spiritual, that they ought to know that they have offended. They ought to know that they have offended me. I'm waiting for him month after month and he doesn't come to me. What are you going to do about it? Looking to me. Well, I told him, you have to go to him taking the initiative. I will not. I will not. And that's often the posture of individuals. I will not go to them. I will not do that. I will not talk further with him until he does. I've got one path for you to go down, and that's you take the initiative to go to the one who you believe has sinned against you. It's Matthew chapter 18. Well, God took the initiative in the garden. And notice well, that God took the initiative, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
You didn't wait till we made ourselves better. The human race got worse and worse, even though they had uh, revelation and they had uh, chapters and books of the Bible and the Old Testament. The human race has not gotten better on its own. So God takes the initiative. And while we were sinners, God came to us. God brought his son. And he then spoke to us through his son and through the death of his son. How has God forgiven us in Christ Jesus? He took the initiative, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And I can't uh, exactly explain to you how God foreknew and he, how he chose us ahead of time. But again, it's a form of God taking the initiative right from the beginning and even before the creation of the world. He took the initiative for giving us. How did God do this? He took the initiative. Christ died to forgive us. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God take, took the initiative of forgiving us. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He gave it away, nailing it to the cross. He took the initiative, Colossians chapter 2. Christ forgave us before we even thought of asking. There in the throne of death, carrying the cross, before the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lot blaspheming his name, putting thorns upon his brow, scourging him until he was almost dead with the blood flowing from him. Yet Christ said, forgive them, forgive them. He took the initiative in the worst of agony that's ever been experienced by any human being. Do you understand how, uh, and do you understand and do you appreciate how God in Christ has forgiven you? Do you know how he's forgiven you? Do you appreciate it? Have you meditated upon it until it's in every corpuscle of your being, every soul of your part, uh, of your being, of your flesh and blood and your mind? Have you soaked in the forgiveness of God and what Christ went through? If you have, that is the preparation for forgiving others. Every time you're wounded, harmed, hurt intentionally or otherwise, remember how Christ was wounded. In every way, in every form of suffering, Christ suffered. We can never say God doesn't understand because he doesn't know this suffering. Ah, Christ suffered it all and even the father watching his son suffer would be the greatest of pains for the father. Have you thought about it till, till it's deeply in your soul and heart? He took the initiative forgiving us as we pounded nails into his flesh. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Let me just stop there to tell a bit about myself. At age 12, I became a believer in Jesus Christ, but I hadn't given myself totally over to him. I was then in college and I wondered what my what life would amount to. And uh, one day, you know, I was so despondent, so discouraged, not knowing what to do with my life. And I realized as I was told again and again, do something for God, I realized I had nothing to give God, no great talent, no great abilities to give him. And I sobbed and I wept and I was in my car and I pounded the steering wheel in agony and feeling terrible. And then I realized for the first time what a sinner I was. Now I wasn't one who was street smart. I hadn't done anything illegal in my life. Everybody on the outside would say I was a very nice young man. But inside I realized I was critical and cruel in my mind against other people. I was very proud. 
so proud that I wouldn't speak. I was afraid of being wrong in some way. And uh, there was a verse I found in the Bible that my pride encompasses me like a chain. Pride kept me very quiet and still. I appeared to be humble, but I wasn't. And I finally realized what Christ had done for me and the death on the cross, that was for me. I mean, it, it gripped me to an extent I'd never experienced before. And I sobbed all the more to think that he the perfect died for me the imperfect. I felt like Peter felt after uh, Jesus had outfished him and, and had the great number of fish in his boat after they had fished all night. He said, throw the nets on the other side. And it took two boats to take it all in. And Peter's response was, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And I felt that way, get away from me. You are so good, I've, this bright light of your holy presence is too much for me to bear. But I had to succumb and I had to say, okay, take my life and do what you will. Do what you want with it. I can't make anything of my life. Your forgiveness is so great. I actually can't bear it. Well, that was a changing point in my life. I said, I'll just take me and do any little thing or whatever you want with me. Do nothing with me if you want, but I'm yours. Here I am. Well, the experience of that forgiveness caused me to see other people in a different light. Uh, prejudice, looking down at people that did things I didn't approve of, those kinds of things, and, and so forth. And the next morning I went back to college and I was driving along and the telephone poles looked like crosses and I began to sing, the cross before me, the world behind me. Well, this was a point in time when God came to me showing me how he had forgiven me. And it has been easier, not always easy, but easier to forgive people from that point on. And that was the premeditated moment, a moment that I have to return to again and again. But uh, the change came as I realized that he had taken the initiative, pursuing and chasing me, the God of heaven. It's only his love that allows us to forgive others as we've been forgiven. He died in order to forgive us. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Have you received God's forgiveness in Christ Jesus? That's the question. If you have, forgive as forgiven. 